then we get into this whole thing, religion, spirituality, God. Okay. Do you think it's even appropriate for me to talk about this in a sexual abuse seminar, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Good. Because do our clients of all ages come with questions and fears and beliefs about religion, spirituality, and God based on their experience of abuse? Yes. The best book I've read so far on this is Dan Allender's book. It's on page 63 in your bibliography. It's called The Wounded Heart. And his book is specifically about how sexual abuse interferes with our developmental concept of higher power and our developmental stage of that. Okay. Here are some of the things I've heard. Well, God was supposed to protect me. God didn't protect me. God, God abandoned me. I had to do it all on my own. I prayed every night for the abuse to stop. It didn't stop. It continued. Well, I was told if I was a good boy or a good girl that God would protect me and this wouldn't happen. So I must be really bad because it did happen. And I tried to be so good. And I'm still trying to be so good. And it's still happening. Well, I can prove to you the non-existence of God because if God existed, this wouldn't be happening. Well, I'm so angry at God, and I've been angry for a long time. Don't talk to me about God. Okay? I don't even want to go there. Well, I was abused by a clergy person. <laughs> don't go there with me. So here are a few things that I do. And again, I'm going to remind you, keep an open mind, take what you like, leave the rest. This is difficult stuff. People have feelings about this. All right. One, I have a bottom line philosophy that is always dealing with concept of higher power, no matter whether we say that or not. And it's called the 12 healing steps. Here are the first three steps of the 12 healing steps. And it's there. I don't know what page. 46? 47. OK. Admit you're powerless over the abuse. Your life has become unmanageable. Always working on the first step, no matter whether it's a kid, adolescent, or adult. What does that mean? It means always working on looking at, there's no way you could have caused this. There's no way you could have controlled it. And unfortunately, there's no cure for it. I believe I would love for there to be a cure. I could really do something else. Okay? You guys would have better things to do than to be here during the day. But right now, this is the reality. So powerless does not equal helpless. It equals no way did I cause it, can't control it, can't cure it. What I can control, what I do have power over, is how I react and deal with it in my life. Okay. My life has become unmanageable. What does that mean? My survival skills are now causing a heck of a lot more problems than they're solving. Okay. Yeah. I need help is the statement of step one. I've been doing it alone, can't do it alone anymore. I need help. Statement of step one, the problem. If I stay there too long, I will become hopeless and I will feel helpless. So this is a program of action. Sexual trauma treatment and recovery is a program of action. And so I need to move to step two pretty quickly. And that is, all right, I need help. Am I willing to ask for help? Second step in AA says, came to believe in a power greater than ourselves that could restore us to sanity. I believe in willingness to ask for help. I am coming to believe in a power greater than self that can restore me to sanity. I'm asking for help from you, from the group, from other people. That's a power greater than me. The relationship I have with the therapist, with my group therapy, with my support system is a power greater than me alone. You may come up with suggestions that I could have never thought by myself. You have skills I don't have that you can teach me. This is a power greater than me. Developmentally, children believe their adult caregivers are God. And they attribute those characteristics to God and higher power. So you may be God-like figure for somebody for a while. Because developmentally, that's where they're at. Be careful it doesn't go to your ego. Know, it, know that it is a, is a appropriate developmental stage and that you're going to keep moving to work to, to have them move on from that. So the relationship and possibly you for a while is a power greater than them. Okay. So they're willing to ask for help. Restored to sanity. They've been doing the same thing, expecting different results. If they ask for help, there is a possibility 
that they can start doing it different to get different results. But they have to take the leap of faith, spiritual principle of faith, into step three. Are they going to take suggestions? Because when they take suggestions, they are turning their will in their life over to the care of this power greater than self. How many people work the yes butters? Okay. The yes butters, give it over, take it back. Give it over, take it back. Okay. So my question is, all right, I notice your yes butting. What are you scared of? What's, what are you afraid of if you do it? What are you afraid of that you don't do it? So I stay out of shaming them. We're always looking at what's going on. Okay? Absolutely your choice whether you take the suggestion or not, what the reality is. If you always do what you've always done, you're always going to get what you've always got. Okay. Again, keeps me out of rescuer. So with this model, just in these first three steps, it is a spiritual philosophy and approach. Can't do it alone, willing to ask for help, believe in that help, and willing to take suggestions. So when people tell me later on, I have no faith, I don't believe in a power greater than self, I say, oh, really? You already worked the first three steps. You have faith. You keep showing up, and you keep taking suggestions and doing what's suggested to you, and you're, you have faith. You believe. Okay. So that's without ever mentioning the word God. Okay. If we do mention the word God, I will ask somebody to draw a picture for me. When I say God, draw me the picture. They draw a picture. I say three adjectives with that picture, please. I get mean, scary, punishing, and or absent. I always get the same three or four. Who are they really drawing? Their perpetrator or the other adults in their life who didn't protect them? Do they have feelings about these adults who didn't protect them? Yes, they do. Do you need to do work around that? Yes. Do you only pay attention to the, per the perpetrator? No. Okay. Can they be angry at both the perp and the other caregivers in their life at the same time? They can, but you know what? They probably won't be because it's too scary and they'll feel like an orphan. So you may do one piece at a time. And you might acknowledge, you might be angry at both of them. It's OK. You just do whatever you do. All right. So you got the picture of God, mean, scary, punishing, and absent. Then I say, all right, if you could choose any God that you want to have in your life, draw me a picture. Give me three adjectives. I get loving, caring, and forgiving always. I say, OK, now I make you the CEO of a very important company called Your Life. You're the big boss. You want God to be loving, caring, and forgiving, but God is mean, scary, punishing, and absent. How well is God doing its job? Not that well. What do you do with somebody who doesn't do their job well? You fire them. Good. Fire the old God, hire a new one. That's when people say to me, OK, Adina, you have just jumped off the cliff. <laughs> You know, you, we don't, you know, God doesn't work for us. We work for God. And God is who God is. Read it in the book. And then I say, OK, if that's the way that you, if that's the way you work, then that's the way I, I don't work that way. And it, it hasn't worked that way for my clients. The power, and this is a 12-step model again, God as we understood God. I can make the choice of what kind of higher power I have in my life. I can have a personal relationship with this power greater than myself. I'm presenting a model. It doesn't have to be your model. Okay. want to give you, um, oh, the other piece is that there is a difference between religion and spirituality. And one of the pieces that people get kind of caught with is that religion equals spirituality. Okay. And so we do a lot of stuff around how you can be spiritual, zest for life, feel good about yourself, feel connected, and not necessarily be in an organized religion. That you can be there, and it can support you feeling alive and connected. And it could be that the organized religion of your childhood helped you to feel more isolated, and to look at that and grieve some of that, and to look and see what fits for you today. So I really advocate for work with clergy. I really advocate for work with clergy who fit what you believe. I want people to go to clergy. Clergy say, absolutely, you can be angry with God. God's big enough to handle it. Go ahead and do your anger work with Adina. Rather than to say, you better not be angry with God. God's going to strike you. Because I've had clients who go and get told that. And now they're, also, they're all freaked out again. This is a big deal, folks. I want you to look at that definition of forgiveness. 
a process of, under, of letting go and understanding that is a gift for myself. Forgiveness is not condoning. It is not forgetting. It is not reconciliation. It is not absolving of sin. It's a process. This model that I'm telling you today is that the sexual trauma recovery process equals the grieving process, equals the healing process, equals the forgiveness process. Forgiveness, healing, and grieving process are all one and the same. And so as I learn to forgive, which is the letting go of the bitterness, the anger, the hostility, the resentment, the shame, the guilt, and I understand that this person was sick too, and that I'm not the first person in my family system, and that I can separate them from their behavior. I might love them and hate what they did. That that's a gift for me because I get more sleep. I have more peace. I move on with my life. I don't get stuck anymore. I'm not stuck in the victim role. That's a gift for me. That I am acting as if I love myself by doing this. And I am in process of letting go of hate for myself that I've had and the toxic shame and guilt that I've had so that I can feel the freedom and be really intimate with myself, my higher power, and the rest of the world. That's the freedom of recovery. So the question asked, can people who've been sexually abused have healthy relationships? What's the answer? Yes, of course they can. Can they thrive? Absolutely. Does it happen right away? No. There is hope, there is thriving, there is health, there is intimacy, there is fun, there is laughter, there is joking. Okay. My therapist said to me, you know, there are more levels of pain than you're experiencing right now. And that you can experience this level of pain is a testament to your growth. I'm thinking, you're nuts. I'm in a lot of pain here. This means I did no work at all and I'm just back to the same place. And he said, uh-uh. It's a testament to your growth that you can manage this much pain right now, and there's more. And then I said, yeah, right, you just want to keep going on vacation. <laughs> keep being in therapy, OK? The reality is more thriving, less surviving. More thriving, less surviving. I will get triggered. I will get out of it faster. I have thriving skills on board, and that's what I practice. So I will get triggered. I'll go into survival mode. I get out of it faster. I spend more of my life in thriving, less, in my less of my life in surviving. 